welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Kasaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Nadine Nakamura, a representative in the State House from Kauai and the chair of the Housing Committee. She is also on the Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs Committee and the Transportation Committee, all very important committees in the legislature. She grew up on Oahu and studied public affairs and urban planning at USC and the University of Hawaii. She was a planner, Hawaii County Council person, managing director, and is a state representative. Nadine, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. And please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're in politics. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks for the invitation okay, yeah. to be on your show. Yes. I, um, wanted to get involved in politics. Um, I, you know, worked for the city and county of Honolulu on the, in the transportation, doing rapid transit a long time ago, working in Department of Land Utilization for the city. I also worked for a nonprofit housing developer. So uh, when I moved to Kauai in 92, I worked actually for you in your office because we didn't have electricity in Kauai, where I live. And uh, that's where I got my start in private consulting on Kauai. And I did that for over 20 years. And I decided that uh, after working on you know, the general plan update, working on uh, environmental assessments and developing the Hawaii Home Ownership Center, the Kauai Planning and Action Alliance, I decided I wanted to contribute to in a different way. So I ran for the Kauai County Council. I took a two thirds cut in my pay and I uh, ran for office in 2010 and then in 2012. Uh, I enjoyed the experience and uh, Mayor Carvalho asked me to be his managing director in 2013, and I really love that job. I learned so much about the county, um, and uh, I think we did some great things. And I, um, when this opening came up, uh, when Rep Kawakami stepped down to serve on the Kauai County Council, I ran for this open seat serving east and north shores of Kauai, and uh, I got elected. So, um, this is my uh, third term in office, and I plan to run again next year. Thanks. Um, as mentioned, you're uh, on the chair of the Housing Committee, which is a very uh, important committee. Um, so what are you working on in the uh, legislature and your passion? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, housing is top of mind for so many families in Hawaii who are struggling because the cost of housing and how much people make in their annual salary, there's such a huge disparity. Uh, so we know that there's housing needs all across the continuum from those with extremely low incomes, very low incomes, moderate incomes, um, even workforce housing. Uh, so we have to have strategies for every category of, of needs. And so we are um, working hard to uh, address the needs across the board. We know what has been successful is the use of the low-income housing tax credits, coupled with the rental housing revolving fund and the Hula May multifamily bonds. We also um, know that you know, the federal programs like uh, housing vouchers, Section 8, and we have our own rent subsidy really helps to keep people into homes and prevent people from being homeless. We also have a whole number of homeless programs uh, that uh, we funded, including Ohana Zones that help every county to develop emergency shelters, transitional housing, and the social services and wraparound services that are needed for many of the groups at the extremely low income category. Yeah, and then we appreciate, you know, that uh, uh, low income, you know, the low end of the spectrum. You mentioned, you know, moderate and workforce housing. I think, you know, we need a lot of work on that. Um, 
time. You know, you mentioned the uh, yes. income housing tax credit. I think you know stuff like the revolving funds uh, would do good on in, in all spectrum, right? Like uh, HFTC had a lot of money in there before at about 1990. They had they had about a, a billion dollars in assets and they started Kapolei and all that with our friends, uh, Dennis Takahashi and uh, those people at HFTC. Uh, and she's retiring. So I hope we get to continue the work over there. That's uh, gonna be a big loss for the state. Yeah, it is. Um, in a way, uh, where do you see us working uh, to help with the workforce housing and in that category or level? Yeah, I think um, what we need to do uh, is to work with the counties and work with the private developers to um, help bring down the cost of developing these homes. And a big chunk of it is the infrastructure costs. So we have this amazing opportunity with the Biden in Infrastructure and Jobs Act that Congress passed um, last month that gives us um, a lot of funding for highways, for uh, water infrastructure and wastewater infrastructure through uh, the existing revolving loan funds. So what we are doing is working through the Hawaii Business Roundtable together with uh, the private sector, uh, working with the counties, uh, involving the mayors on each county and the you know, we, you need to have the whole team involved, the housing agency, the public works departments or environmental services and the planning departments to prioritize the affordable housing projects in each county and then see what the infrastructure needs are and then try and target the infrastructure funds around these projects. So we're working hand in hand to deliver um, housing across the spectrum. It includes workforce housing. And we all know that the higher you go, it's actually the easier to develop because uh, with many of the counties have now waiver programs. They have uh, additional dwelling unit programs that help to increase density. And we should be promoting more of that. And then with the waiver programs that substantially cuts down the cost of development, and then it makes workforce housing um, possible. Then we need to continue the use of exempting general excise taxes from all of these developments across the board that also brings down the cost of housing. So uh, I think it's, it's all of these combined strategies that we need to work on to um, to partner with the private sector and counties to, to make housing affordable. Yeah, I, yeah, I've always said, you know, we, we gotta work with the uh, government agencies and, and they gotta, you know, not uh, put so many restrictions, you know, like sometimes, you know, you all want, you know, all rectangular shaped lots, they regulate the size and shape, you know, that uh, kind of cuts down on that. One thing that might be good is, um, you know, when a developer has to put a project and they got to put in, you know, thousands of feet of water line infrastructure, if they have some kind of proportionate share refund, if somebody hook up, you know, they're waiting for the next guy to come in and put it in. Right. Know, or the county or the state not going to put it in if they get some kind of proportion and say refund and guy would hook up to that. They had such a thing at the county water department before. I don't know why they got rid of it. The I think the they... current uh, policies have discouraged the development of housing because developers cannot afford all of the upfront costs right. of infrastructure. It's always the last guy in has to pay for everything. Right. I, so I agree with you, Dennis. Yeah. This um, needs to be addressed. And that's why we have um, the Department of Health at the table. We have Department of Transportation at the table, sitting down with the counties to see, okay, 
with this influx of federal infrastructure funds, how can we work together to make sure the low hanging housing developments get built? We, you know, we have this opportunity now to think strategically. And um, I, I think uh, we have a lot of agreement that this is the way to go. Yeah, thanks. Um, we mentioned, you know, you're on the transportation committee. Uh, Tying the two together, there's the, the transit-oriented development. You want to talk a little bit about that? Right. So, you know, for Honolulu, there's the rail line and stations. And the idea is to, you know, do what, what every other major city with rail does, is you develop densely around these stations. So you prevent urban sprawl. Uh, and so, uh, in, on the neighbor islands, that means building around the bus transit stations and um, making sure that, uh, you know, people who, if we can build more densely, uh, build housing at all levels around these stations and around the bus transit um, stations, we can um, meet our affordable housing needs. But we have to... Uh, target our resources and um, we need to create these mobility hubs so people can live and work where you know not have to have a car or not have to have the second car uh, that you know most families have uh, we want to encourage the use of you know bicycling walking uh, make create these livable walkable communities to and reduce the reliance on single occupancy vehicles so that's kind of the uh, the goal is to you know to take advantage of uh, rapid mass transportation to get people around and but to do it in a way that it's so frequent and convenient that people will want to use it. Yeah, it, it's uh, on paper. You know, it, it's all good if you have a clean sheet. You get a transit and a, a hub there. You know, at least you know, slightly expand whatever build up. But then you got, you got Waikiki, we got the ocean on one side and we cannot, well, you got the mountain on the other side. And then which leads us to the rail coming in. We don't know where it's gonna end up. Um, that, like you mentioned that on Oahu, it's uh, mostly around the rail hubs, right? Well, the city and county is also looking, uh, I think the new administration is also looking at um, other developments um, along uh, urban areas that may have infrastructure capacity now. And so they, they're looking at both alternatives along the transit stations, but also in other areas. Um, but they're, you know, the whole idea is low hanging fruit where we can do development um, sooner than later because we know the need is so great. Um, yeah, we got the low hanging fruit, but it kind of like uh, <laughs> killing itself. Um, we talked about this before. We had the, uh, what's that? Park and ride parking lot, which is supposed to do that. You park there, catch a bus and up. And, uh, and we took away that parking lot for Low income housing, so it kind of goes against itself and you know, against this and um, the hub thing where everybody parks and then you don't have cars running all over. Yeah, and so I think that's what the um, county is looking at. From my understanding, they're looking at mobility hubs that um, make sense around the island and uh, the need to do um, update current shuttle studies to look at where they make the most sense, where it's very accessible to visitors and residents. Uh, uh, and one of the ideas is to look at Coconut Marketplace where you've got a number of visitors who could potentially walk to for a visitor center and a, a shuttle pickup area, get on to the shuttle, and go see the island, you know, just to take different tours using a shuttle versus going around in a single occupancy vehicle and creating more congestion on our limited um, highways on Kauai. 
Yeah, you've seen, you've seen the traffic right in front of this component marketplace, right? Right. Um, yeah, we got the, the county of Kauai wanted to do such a, I guess it's part of the transit and development concept at the county building, whatever they call it. Uh, but it, I don't think it went off the ground and there's no, no, nobody came in and said they want to partner with the county. Yeah. So I think there the county has decided to step back, work on their master plan, and then reissue an, an RFP once the master plan is, is complete. And that's what we're doing on the grounds of Mahilona Hospital and then the surrounding state-owned lands. There's, you know, close to uh, 35 to 40 acres of vacant lands. And we're working on the master plan revisions right now to uh, look at all the needs in the community, in the region. Um, and uh, we know there's a need uh, for adult daycare center, assisted living, affordable housing. Uh, there's uh, a lot of needs, uh, even relocating the state library. So uh, we're, we're looking at the mobility hub concept there where you know, this is where the bus stops and drops off people. And we know the teachers and healthcare workers want to live where they work. So we're going to design it around those needs and um, hopefully reduce the number of vehicle trips on our, again, our limited roadways. So uh, where does that stand right now, that, that study on my Helena area? So they're... Um, working on the master plan phase two. Uh, last session, we were able to get funding for the water well and tanks at Kapahi so that uh, they can serve additional um, capacity for both of, for the elementary school, the high school and the hospital campus and future development. So that is in the works. Uh, we're hoping um, to have the sewer capacity and then um, we will be working uh, once the, the master plan is done we will be going into the EIS and um, county entitlements and subdivision. So there is a consultant already doing the master yes, plan. Yeah. Consultant on board. Yeah they got uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of public uh, input on that. Yes, and they will be initiating um, community meetings early next year. On the top of here, you know which consultant is doing that? Yes, PBR Hawaii. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see, you're on the Hawaiian Affairs Committee. Um, well, we got, you know, leaders to Hawaiian homes. Uh, any progress or, you know? What, what are you guys doing on that? Yeah, I think uh, last year it was unprecedented, the amount of funding, uh, capital improvement funds that DHHL received from the state. It was close to $70 million uh, to uh, carry on their program of um, uh, developing uh, house lots uh, for our homeless, or excuse me, the DHHL, the Native Hawaiian uh, waiting list. Um, we are also interestingly working with OHA, uh, DHHL and um, how to prove counselors to figure out how can we get our Native Hawaiians ready for rental and home ownership opportunities uh, over the next five years. Uh, because of the funding that uh, the legislature has put into affordable housing, there's going to be um, 8,000 units of affordable housing on the market. And we need to get our Native Hawaiian communities, many who are homeless, many who are living in overcrowded conditions to be prepared for homeownership or renter uh, rental housing. And so we have this initiative working with uh, OHA to, uh, to uh, 
get resources out to the HUD approved counselors to be doing the one on one counseling and the home buyer education uh, to prepare our families uh, for these opportunities. And then we're also working with the University of Hawaii, UHERO, to, um, to also create a uh, housing database so that we have uh, real-time information on housing opportunities, both rental and for sale opportunities uh, by county, by districts, uh, so people can do searches and um, understand what the opportunities are currently and in the future. Yeah, um, Kauai uh, HHL has a lot of property, you know, thousands of acres. They also got some, quote, developed uh, lots, you know, the roadways and utilities put in, but it's vacant uh, from what I understand, you know. People who cannot uh, qualify to put in their own housing, so maybe they get a the department has to put in the housing or something. Just you get a look at all aspects of that, as you mentioned. That is, uh, you know, I think DHHL is uh, open to, you know, having people put what they can afford on those lots. It might be a tiny home. Uh, I know um, the Anahola Homestead Association has worked on a prototype for a a tiny home, uh, there's, um, you know, different opportunity. Habitat for Humanity is doing an amazing job. Um, right. When people put in their own sweat equity and bring down the cost of housing, I think that's a really great model yeah. for Hawaii because they're, uh, they have such amazing capacity and it's a great model for the whole state. Yeah, um, especially on Kauai, they're, do they're doing a great job, I think, right. more than some of the other places. Like and in it, you know, in LA, LA, the, you know, they're building a three bedroom, one or one and a half bath home uh, a few years ago with a mortgage of $240,000. Right. At the time of closing, that home was worth $400,000. And today it would probably be worth $600,000. Yeah. So this is how we build our middle class. This is how we build housing security. And we know that um, the Habitat model also builds community because families are working together. They go through these, this hard period of working on each other's homes. They, they learn home ownership skills and they have um, a built-in community when they're done. So it's a, a, re it's a reason why last session I introduced the Affordable Home Ownership Revolving Fund and uh, that passed, and this is to help programs like Habitat do more of what they're doing because they're doing it so well. Yeah, like I mentioned on Kauai, you get Steven Spears and Milani. Right. So now other organizations uh, and people want to partner with them to, to help them uh, get more house, people in houses. Yes. Um, and I really what, like the model. I, I think it'd be great uh, if, it, you know, we could do more of that on Hawaiian homelands and other uh, infill housing um, and large scale subdivisions like they did in LA. I know, I know um, Claudia Shea and uh, self help housing was doing stuff like that before, right? Yes, and they continue to oh, do yeah. it in uh, Nanakuli. They bought um, a whole subdivision that w went through foreclosure. Uh, during the last recession, and they are building these fabulous two-story homes uh, that have uh, these million-dollar views, uh, and they are likewise quite affordable, under four hundred thousand dollars per unit. Yeah, uh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you um, you served on a lot of other and kind of boards and commissions before. Were you on HFDC also before? I did. I yeah. think I followed you. Did <laughs> yeah. you left? I was yeah. on. And and the uh, Hawaii Tur Tourism Authority. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, we got a little bit. I'm going to talk about tourism and where do we go from here? Sure. I'm very happy with the leadership of Hawaii Tourism Authority in uh, pivoting 
from um, promoting tourism to destination management. And yes, we do need to promote tourism, but we also need to manage the impacts of visitors in our communities around the state. And I think I see a real commitment to doing that. Every, um, every visitor bureau has now hired a destination manager and each has a pot of funds to now implement their destination management plans. I think what we did in Haena State Park is a great example of how we bring community, the county, the state, uh, and, and the visitor industry together to do problem solving. And, you know, we did that by um, uh, facilitated several years of meetings, uh, even before the flood event, uh, to uh, talk about what some of the solutions are gonna be. And luckily, and then the flood happened and we had resources to implement the Haina State Master Plan and our shuttle plan. Uh, we were super fortunate to uh, ha have the 100% support from the state deal in our parks division. They uh, put together the, all of the improvements at the park that were devastated from the flooding event. And then we put together a parking reservation system and several of my bills passed that increased the parking fines from $35 to $235 because of the illegal parking. Right. Uh, and then last year, a few other bills passed that helps to increase the entry, entrance fees uh, based on peak hour, peak demand. And then we also allowed the uh, county police chiefs on every island to hire non-police officers to do parking citations on state highways. So oh, um, and that, those funds go to the counties for enforcement. Okay. Um, I understand that tourism was in the past few weeks was really low in what in the Waikiki area, and now it picked up only because of the, the military water fuel problem, right? That that's a big issue. I mean, they're filling up the hotels in Waikiki, but what do you got to say about the the fuel issue at Red Hill? Yes, I. I believe that um, the many in the state legislature have signed on uh, asking you know, the military to um, remove those underground storage, uh, fuel storage tanks um, <clears throat> and to um, address this concern. Yeah, there's about 2000 families that are eligible for hotels in Waikiki until January of next year uh, because of this issue. And it's a major concern. I believe the state um, needs to have a in-state water testing facility that we should not be spending five days or a week um, sending samples to the mainland, to the West Coast, to figure out the quality of our water. We need that capacity. And you know, when I was managing director, we had a similar problem in Lihui with um, I think it was bacteria in the water. And again, we had to wait <laughs> five to seven days to get the test results. And well, we... now you tell me we had bacteria in the water. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> I think we, they were great. They, they sent water, bottled water to families impacted and um, the water department on Kauai did a great job as well. Uh, getting the word out. I think it was in, I forget what area, uh, but uh, it was, uh, we need that capacity in state. We should not have to wait and <laughs> get lost packages in the mail and then wait longer for, for this result. I think it's a public health issue. I believe the legislature will be addressing this issue next session. Okay, thanks, Nadine. And I just see a note like our, our time is running out. Any uh, last words? No, just, Thank you, Dennis, for you know this opportunity to talk story with you. It's been a while, yeah. so it's been fun. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, thank you, Nadine, for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii, and thank you to the listeners. Mahalo, aloha, hoi ho, and happy holidays. See you next year. <laughs>